So let's look a little more at the electromagnetic spectrum. So here in the middle is what we refer to as visible light. This is what we can see with our eyes. And if we expand that, we see over here with a wavelength of 750 nanometers is the red light, and over here is the violet light with 400 nanometers, and the other colors are in between. But outside of that, there are other forms of electromagnetic radiation, and you may be familiar with some of them. There's ultraviolet radiation. Hopefully you've heard about that, and you understand that there's ultraviolet UV radiation that comes from the sun, and you need to take care not to get sunburned by it, right? Well, this ultraviolet radiation has a wavelength that's shorter than violet light. Short wavelength, high energy. UV radiation has more energy, and that's why it can give you a sunburn. We can't see UV light, and so that makes it kind of dangerous because you may think that you're fine and you're not. If we go to even shorter wavelengths, we get to x-rays. We know that x-rays can be very helpful, but they're also potentially dangerous. And beyond that, into even shorter wavelengths and higher energy, we get into gamma rays, and those are given off by radioact uh, ra nuclear events, and those are extremely dangerous. Going the other direction in terms of longer wavelengths and, sh and less energy, we get infrared radiation. Um, and so like a heat lamp will give off a little bit of a red glow, right? But the reason you have a heat lamp is not for the light that it gives off. It's because it gives off a lot of heat. And we go further and we get to microwaves. And those are the same microwaves that are in your microwave oven and heat up your food. And we go to even lower energy and we get to radio waves. The, the waves that carry the radio station to your radio are related to visible light and they're related to gamma rays. But they're different in terms of the... Um, the wavelength and the energy that they carry. Did you ever wonder how, how a radio picks up sound? There's a radio station off somewhere, and then here's your radio, and it's not connected by anything. And you can tune it and get all these different radio stations. Do you ever think about that? It's really kind of crazy when you think about it. The radio is sensitive to these particular um, frequencies and wavelengths of ra electromagnetic radiation. And, and when you tune the dial, you're going to a slightly different frequency. On the dial, it lists it out in frequencies. And then it, it converts that back into sound that we can hear. So gamma rays, most energetic. <coughs> they are produced by the sun. And the stars, which are, the sun is a massive incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear inferno. Um, if you've never listened to They Might Be Giants, they have some really great science songs. Um, and also certain unstable nuclei, nuclear reactions that can occur on Earth will also give off gamma rays. Um, gamma rays um, can be very, very dangerous because they'll damage biological tissue. We have x-rays, those are pretty useful, but also, again, potentially dangerous. I kind of said all of this. Ultraviolet can give you a sunburn, or it can give you a suntan, depending on how much, how much you, of it you get. Um, it will also cause premature wrinkling of the skin, cataracts, increased risk of skin cancer, all kinds of good stuff. Visible light. Visible light does not damage biological tissues, okay? All those other ones that we mentioned just now, the gamma rays and the ultraviolet radiation and the x-rays, those are higher energy than visible light, and so they can cause damage to your body. But visible light does not. Our eyes are sensitive to the visible light and translate that into sing signals that our brains interpret. The, the lower energy are these, these other ones, the infrared and the radio waves and the microwaves. 
Infrared photography and infrared sensors are, are pretty interesting. Um, here's a photograph of a man with a couple of dogs. Three dogs, actually. There's one sleeping over here. If we look at infrared, we, we see where the heat is. Okay, So the heat is, has infrared components to it. And so if you have a sensor that picks that up, you can see this guy's you know, legs are exposed. So his skin is warm. There's his face. Um, the eyes and ears of the dogs are a little warmer. And so we see that. And so the, the night vision goggles and stuff that you can get, a lot of those are infrared. And they will see heat sources. They don't allow you to see like you would during the daylight, but they allow you to visualize things. You know, so if you've got a fugitive hiding in the woods, you fly over with an infrared sensor in a helicopter, he's going to stick out pretty dramatically in the woods there. Microwaves. Um, Microwaves are interesting because you probably all use them maybe almost daily. Um, microwaves work because, um, microwave ovens work, because most food has water in it. And water is sensitive to that particular frequency of the microwaves, and it will vibrate and generate heat. So if you're warming something that doesn't contain any water, it's not going to heat up very well. Um, and then there are some dishes that you should not use in the microwave because they also absorb the microwave energy and they get very, very hot. And eventually they'll, they'll break. And you definitely don't want to put metal in the microwave oven because it'll spark and cause all kinds of problems. And then there's radio waves. And cellular telephone signals and television signals all form all fall into that range as well. So here's an example. Arrange the three types of electromagnetic radiation in order of increasing wavelength. Okay, and it's just asking us about three. Which one has which one of these? has the lowest wavelength, because they want increasing. I mean, start at the lowest. So there's, there's different ways to remember things like this. It's easier for me to remember these in order of energy, because things that are higher energy are more dangerous, and things that are lower energy are less dangerous. So we've got visible light, x-rays, and microwaves. Well, which is most dangerous? The x-rays, right? That means it has the most energy. More energy is that longer wavelength or shorter wavelength? Short wavelength. So the x-rays are the shortest wavelength. And then what's the next bigger one? Of these three, visible, x-rays, and microwaves. Actually, it's the visible. And then the microwaves. So you should have you should have a reasonable idea of that, that range and which is mo more energetic and which is, is less energetic and then be able to tell me relative the wavelength, frequency, and energy. So if the frequency, if the frequency of x-rays is, I'm sorry, if the wavelength is short, then the frequency is high or low? High. So if we're ordering these in terms of frequency, then the order is reversed. And so we have the microwaves being the lowest frequency, and then the visible in the middle, and then the x-rays. Energy per photon. Don't let the per photon mess you up. What's a photon? A photon's a piece of light, a packet of light. So which of these is more energetic? 
the thing with the higher frequency is more energetic, right? So the, the x-rays are the most energetic and the microwaves are the least energetic. And so down here we have the microwaves and then the visible and then the x-rays. Any questions? This is a picture of a neon light. Memphis sound, cool jazz, hot blues. The orange part of this at, is um, a glass tube that actually contains the gas neon. And when you excite neon with electrical energy, it gives off that characteristic red-orange color. And so each element is going to emit its own particular color. Here on the left, we have um, a mercury lamp. And this is the same idea as a neon light. We have a, a glass tube, and it's got mercury vapor in it. And then we apply a voltage across it. We run electricity through it. And the mercury lamp gives off a blue light. Over here on the right is a hydrogen lamp. And that gives off pink light. So each element is going to give off its own color of light. We talked about prisms and rainbows. And when we take light from the sun, which is white light, um, it's continuous, and we pass it through a prism, we see a continuous spectrum. We see all the colors. When we take light that's emitted from, say, that hydrogen lamp, and pass it through a prism, we don't see a rainbow, we see a few lines of particular color, and it's always the same. There's this um, blue line, and then there's more of an indigo and a violet line, and then there's kind of a reddish-orange line here. And together, those colors combine to give us that pink um, color. A helium lamp. You pass that through a spectrum and you see a few more lines, but again, there's big regions of blackness in between. The, the helium does not emit a light with this frequency. Neon has a spectrum that's a lot more complicated, and yet it's still a series of lines, and it's not a continuous spectrum like this one is. So this is a continuous white light from the sun, and when we when we achieve light by exciting elements, we see lines. Now, when they first discovered this, this was like, wow, what's going on here? Because this is not what they expected to see. Here's an illustration of the, of the setup here. So here's a hydrogen lamp. And just like we did before with the light bulb, pass it through a slit, pass it through the prism, and it separates according to the wavelength. But now we just see these few lines, and there's nothing in between. So the light that's coming from this hydrogen lamp only has light of particular energies in it. The energy, the wavelength, and the frequency are all related to each other. The speed of the light is the same for everything. So Niels Bohr was the first guy to figure out um, a model, an explanation for why we saw this. And this is an illustration of his model of the atom. And it's a little bit like the solar system. So in the center, we have the nucleus. And what's in the nucleus? We've learned this already. What, what particles are in the nucleus? Protons and neutrons. So the big particles are all squished together in the nucleus. And outside the nucleus are the electrons. So in, in Bohr's model, the electrons are orbiting the nucleus in a similar fashion to how the planets orbit the sun. And we've all studied the solar system in school, and we have at least you know an idea of how this works. We can visualize this. There's the sun, and the planet goes around. 
So we look at this, and we like this model because there's a nucleus, and here's an electron, and it goes around in its little orbit, and it stays the same distance from the nucleus, and everybody's happy, and we can visualize that, and we're good. Unfortunately, this model isn't correct. But it can still be helpful as a starting point to dive into things that are a little harder to understand. So in the Bohr model, there are different orbits, okay, and very creatively named one, two, three, four, five, and you just keep counting as far as you need to. So each of those orbits has a different energy, and you can think of it a little bit like being rungs on a ladder. Now this is a weird ladder, isn't it? Because usually the rungs on a ladder are evenly spaced. But these energies, the energies of these orbits are not evenly spaced. The first orbit has the lowest energy, and then there's a big jump in energy to the second orbit. There's another good size jump, but not as big. As you go up the different orbits, the difference in energy between them gets smaller and smaller. So if your electron is orbiting in that smallest orbit, it has a low energy. If it's in the second orbit, it has much higher energy. Okay? There's, there's nowhere in between. Just like on this ladder, you could stand on the first rung or the second rung. You can't stand in the middle, can you? No. You say, well, what if I held on with my arms and hung, but you're not standing there? You can't stand on nothing. And so there are specific places that the electrons can be, and that's an important concept. So they can only be on one rung or the next. They can only be in one orbit or in the next orbit. So what happens in that hydrogen lamp, and why does it give off light? Well, the electrons are going to naturally be in the lowest energy level that they can be. How many electrons does a hydrogen atom have? One. It's element number one. It has one proton. It has one electron. So hydrogen has one electron. So its one electron is going to be in this lowest energy level. If we excite it or stimulate it, perhaps by passing a high voltage and current through it, we can give that electron energy and cause it to move to a higher energy orbit. When it moves from the first orbit to the third orbit, it has to have increased energy because it's gone from the first rung of the ladder to the third rung of the ladder. This is a higher energy orbit. Well, it turns out that it's not stable up there, and so it will come back. And one word we use for that is relaxation. There's excitation and relaxation. Um, and so relaxing, you're going back to a lower energy level. Well, energy is conserved. If the energy came in and bumped that electron up to a higher orbit, then when the, ener when the electron goes to a lower orbit, that energy has to come back out. When it comes back out, it often has a frequency corresponding to visible light. And so each of those lines in the spectrum is related to electrons moving from one particular orbit to another. And I say this, you know, I, I've got, well, right now I, now I have two teenage boys again. I had two, and then one turned 20, so I only had one teenager, and now number three has turned 13. So I've got 13 and 18. Um, and you guys, if you're not still teenagers, you've been teenagers fairly recently, and so this maybe makes sense to you. Um, teenage boys especially gravitate towards low-energy things most of the time. Zach's favorite position is flat out in bed, messing around on his iPhone, right? Actually, he, didn't, he doesn't have an iPhone yet, on his phone, or his iPod or something. He's laying down, flat, low energy. Now, does he always do that? No. Occasionally, he gets up, gets excited, and he goes off and he does something. In high school, he played football. So he'd go out and he'd play football, go to football practice, and then he'd come back. And what does he do? Does he clean the bathroom? Does he mow the lawn? No, he lays down in his bed and messes around with his phone. Low energy. So 
the electrons, this, this is the electron's bed. It's his low energy state. That's as low as energy as he can be, and that's where he likes to be. But occasionally, he'll get this influx of energy, whether an electric jolt or, you know, dad giving him a kick in the pants and say, get up and mow the lawn. And he'll get up and go to a higher energy level and go off and do something. But then he always reverts back to his ground state. Okay? So electrons are a little bit like teenage boys. The amount of energy in a photon is directly related to its wavelength. Long wavelength is... Low frequency is low energy. Short wavelength, high frequency, high energy. So the, the light that comes out that we see separated by wavelength corresponds to specific energies. Um, so that line, there's a line at 486 nanometers in the hydrogen emission spectrum. And that corresponds from an electron going from orbit 4 to orbit 2. The difference between those two states for the electron, between those two orbits, is an energy that corresponds to 486 nanometers of light. And there's another line at 657. That's longer wavelength and lower energy. That corresponds to an electron moving from n equals 3 orbit to the n equals 2 orbit. So here's an illustration of that. You can see as these orbits go up, they get closer together. The, the difference in energy between 1 and 2 is greater than the difference in energy between 4 and 5. So if we have an electron going from 3 to 2, or from 4 to 2, or from 5 to 2, this is a bigger change in energy, isn't it? Because it's jumping um, 1, 2, 3. It's going down 3 levels. This one's going down 2 levels. This one's going down 1 level. We're comparing them all going down to the second level. So this one's going to have a longer wavelength, but a lower energy. And this one has the highest energy. That's a lot of weird ideas. Do any, anybody have any questions? Does it make any sense? It's a little weird to think that you can take electricity and zap a gas and have it give off light. But what do we have providing light in our classroom? Fluorescent light bulbs. That's exactly how fluorescent light bulbs work. They are filled with a gas and there's no wire in between the ends of a fluorescent light bulb. You've got these little metal things on the end and in between a glass tube filled with gas. And you stick it in the uh, fixture and you turn the switch and it glows and it gives off light. This is the process that's happening above our heads right now. The gas, the gases, the different elements in there absorb the energy of the electricity. The electrons absorb it by moving to higher energy states, to higher levels, higher orbits. But they can't sustain that, and so they jump back down, like Zach. He's going to return to his ground state, his bed. And then when they do that, the energy has to come out, and it comes out in a frequency that we can see. And so it's useful for generating light. <laughs>